Hello students. Today I want to talk about mechanical oscillators. Um, this is a topic which should be information that you can use, particularly if you're going to be going into engineering uh, or electrical engineering, because mechanical oscillators uh, are in every uh, electronic gadget just about that we have. We'll talk about that some more later. So. Um, Here's a mechanical oscillator of uh, the FET simulation. And um, if I pull on this mass, pull down on it, you can see that it's, uh, the system's energy is increasing and uh, all of the energy is in potential energy form. That's this right here. Now, when I let it go, the potential energy becomes kinetic energy and and so the, the oscillation goes on i have it in slow motion here i can make it go normal speed and it goes faster okay now over here i have a friction knob you might not be able to see it but it says damping and i can now introduce some friction and watch what happens when i do that the uh, mechanical energy has been turned into thermal energy. That's what friction does. Now this particular type of friction, it, this is fluid friction, so uh, it depends on the velocity of the mass. Uh, fluid friction um, it, it is zero when the mass is not moving, and let's say it's moving one meter per second, then you might have one newton of friction when it's going two meters per second, two meters. So it scales linearly with the, uh, with the speed. And that's the nature of fluid friction. Uh, okay, now I want to show you that if I have just a little bit of friction, let's just have a little bit of friction, it takes longer for it to slow down and stop oscillating. On the other hand, if I put lots of friction, then it will slow down and stop oscillating much more quickly. All right, so now we can take a look at the notes. What do I have? Now here's a, my oscillator. Uh, bouncing up and down. Um, I'm not including gravity in any of this discussion, right? So it's, it's just the spring and the mass. Um, and without the friction, the motion of the mass is described by the usual formula uh, A cosine omega t. Now the amplitude has a little zero here because it's going to mean the initial amplitude, the amplitude at the beginning. You see, when we start to have friction, then the, uh, if you graph the motion of the mass, it's uh, still a cosine wave, but it's a cosine wave that is decaying, getting smaller and smaller. And so uh, here, here's the formula for it. Here's your cosine still. And uh, you have here uh, a, something that describes how it's getting less and less. Um, you have an exponential here. Let's clear this. And uh, recall that the exponential e to the zero is one. So when the time, when we're just beginning this, the experiment, the time is zero, this is going to be e to the zero, and the amplitude is just a zero, right? The beginning amplitude. But as time increases, uh, e to the minus something, which uh, where the, the minus something is getting bigger and bigger or getting more and more negative, uh, it, this starts to get closer and closer to zero. I think maybe at this point it would be helpful to remind you what the exponential function looks like, right? If I have, uh, this is x, and let's say this is y, e to the, uh, y equals e to the x, 
looks like this. This is y equals e to the x. On the other hand, if I have, um, let's uh, clear that, and let's say I want to graph e to the minus x, all right? So here's x and y again. e to the minus x is the reciprocal of the thing that I previously graphed, and it looks like this. Um, so, so what you're seeing here uh, is uh, uh, e to the minus something times t, and it, it's going to be going down closer and closer to zero. You can, you can think of it sort of doing that. You see, I'm, I, what I did is I connected, tried to connect the tops of these waves here and to get uh, this, uh, this shape. Okay, now let's look at a little bit at the math here. Um, I have e to the minus bt over 2m. So m is the mass that's oscillating, and this letter b is called the damping factor, and it's the one that tells you, uh, or would tell you how much friction, how much fluid friction force you have. So, uh, so the force is minus b um, uh, times the velocity. And um, yeah, the minus, by the way, is because, uh, remember, friction forces are always in the opposite direction so, uh, of the motion. So this minus sign means that when the mass is going up, the friction is downward. On the other hand, when the mass is going down, the friction is upward. Okay. Uh, and um, by the way, uh, you might be wondering, what are the units of B going to be? And they're going to be, uh, the units there are going to be newtons per meter per second, right? So I've got newtons over velocity, force over velocity units. Now, uh, earlier I drew a, um, a, 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 I was trying to draw this uh, exponential. Um, let, let me introduce a little idea here, this uh, vocabulary. This is called a decaying exponential, right? So um, when I drew this, I guess this would be the opposite of a decaying exponential. This would be a growing exponential. And uh, when I drew this, this is known as a decaying exponential. Now, uh, getting back to, to, the, uh, to this here, I can also draw an exponential that connects the bottoms of these, right? So I'm connecting the bottom. And if I uh, drew both of them, like on this right here, say so here's the, the exponential for the tops of the waves, here's the exponential for the top bottoms of the waves. And when you draw both of those, that is called the envelope of the oscillation. Now the word envelope comes uh, from radio engineering. Um, maybe as a slight aside, um, if you were to look at the radio waves coming from an AM transmitter, um, you would see uh, an envelope like this. So the radio waves, which I'll draw, let's see, in green, they're going up and down very, very fast, much faster than I can draw here. But they get bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. That's called the modulation envelope of an amplitude modulated signal. Um, so anyway, that's just stuff for future radio engineers. This is fun stuff. I, I, I really like talking about it. I think you can tell that. Okay, so anyway, uh, you've got some stuff to look at here. Now, let's talk about something called Q, the quality of an oscillator. So earlier when I did the FET simulation, I had uh, the, um, uh, I, I changed the amount of friction. And when the friction was high, 
the oscillator quickly stopped, you know, slowed down and stopped oscillating. When the friction was small, then the oscillation lasted quite a bit longer. So um, this Q, which is, by the way, called the Q factor in electrical engineering, so low Q, that's bad quality, means a lot of friction. High Q, which is good quality, has only a little bit of friction. Okay. Now, uh, the, yeah, let's see here. I've got some more vocabulary. So this, this, this uh, formulation of the, um, the decaying exponential is, is great for mechanical oscillators. And there are many mechanical oscillators, but there are also other kinds of oscillators. So there's a more general description that gets used. And so that's what is happening here. You see, um, the time it took for the, this envelope, for this decaying exponential, to get from the starting amplitude down to this amplitude here, that has a special name. It's called tau. It's called the decay time. It's sometimes called the ring down time. And it's the time it takes for the amplitude to get to 1 over e. Um, e, by the way, is 2.71828. And it goes on and on and on, right? It's an irrational number, just like pi is. So, so that's what e is. And, uh, right, so it's, it's approximately three, right? So it's, uh, the ring down time is about, um, is the time it takes for the amplitude to get to about one third of its original uh, amplitude. Uh, here, the ring down time was longer. It took, you know, from here to here to get down to roughly a third Uh, now, when you want to do the math, so, so the good thing about using tau is that this will work for uh, electromagnetic oscillators. Um, it, 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 has, it, it has more, it's easier, more convenient in the math as well. So, so the, now the formula looks like uh, A0 e to the minus t over tau uh, times the cosine omega t. Right? Yeah, so, so once again, uh, the amplitude of oscillation is a decaying exponential. And, and okay, and then here's another useful thing. Uh, to, uh, for mechanical oscillators, tau equals 2m over b. And B, remember, was that friction number, the damping factor, the book calls it. Okay, so I want to talk about what happens when you're trying to make an oscillator go. Now, one way to make an oscillator go is just to give a shove, and, uh, and it just goes after that. But um, in real life, most oscillators, you make them go by giving them a lot, many gentle pushes at just the right time. So, for example, here, a pendulum oscillator, a child on a, spring, uh, on a swing, um, to make the child go, you want to give the child a push, and then he swings and comes back, and then another push, and then he goes and he comes back, and another push. And if you think about it, you're giving those pushes at a particular rate, um, at a particular frequency that matches the natural frequency of oscillation of, 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 of that particular oscillator of, of the swing. If you were to push boom, 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 boom many times too quickly, then basically the kid would say, well, what's wrong with you? You're, you're not going to get him swinging. And also, if you were to push uh, too slowly, um, maybe what would happen is you might give him a push at the wrong time when he's coming back. So um, this process is called driving an oscillator. And let's take a look. Uh, I found another FET simulation 
This one is about a driven oscillator. So um, it's the same as before, except that it's sort of turned upside down. Um, and now there's a, a, a piston going up and down, uh, connected to the spring, and then here is your mass. Now, this spring mass system um, is set up so that its natural frequency is one hertz. And uh, right now, um, the driver is going too fast. It's going at 1.38 hertz. So it's not working very well. See, if it were working well, this thing would be oscillating a lot more. Let's see what happens if I make it go too slowly, right? So now it's, uh, it's also not really making it go very well. But if I make the driver drive the frequency at one hertz, then you can see that the oscillator really begins to go. So in order to make the oscillator go, you have to match the driving frequency with the, uh, with the natural frequency of the oscillator. Right. So, uh, by the way, right now you can see that it's um, uh, doing huge oscillations. Um, that's what happens when you have, when you're driving a high quality oscillator at just the right frequency. Um, you can end up breaking the oscillator. Let's increase the friction here. I'm increasing the friction. And so now you have a lot less. Okay, now let's take a look at... Go back to the uh, reference sheet by Professor Barnett. What this graph is telling you is that if you have an, an oscillator and you, you drive it at its natural frequency, F0, then the amplitude of oscillation is going to be big. On the other hand, if you drive it at too low a frequency, let's say here, your amplitude of oscillation will be much less. And then similarly, if you drive it at too higher frequency, its amplitude it will be much less. Uh, and, and, and if you have it just at the right uh, frequency, once again, you'd have it, uh, you'd have a much larger. Now, the shape of this curve depends on Q. If Q is a, um, is, a, is a large number, then what you're going to see is this curve will have a different shape. It'll look like it'll be narrower and taller, like this. And uh, for the purposes of making clocks, where you want to have a very accurate uh, uh, frequency, this is good. So a clock, and also the oscillator in a cell phone and in a watch. These are all mechanical oscillators. These devices have drivers that uh, are flexible. They, they don't necessarily want to drive at a particular frequency. They're happy to drive at a frequency that's high or low. Right? In the clock, there's a, a, a ratcheting mechanism that um, that pushes the pendulum to the right, then pushes it to the left. And, and it just, so it, all it does is just wait for the pendulum to get to one side, and then it gives it a little push. And then when it gets the pendulum gets to the other side, it gives it a little push. And in the stop, in, in your wristwatch, there's a similar mechanism. We'll talk about that in a second. And so, uh, so the rate at which the pendulum goes, or your, your clock uh, uh, oscillator goes, really depends on the width of this graph. And so an accurate clock needs a narrow peak. And a narrow peak means a large Q. So a big Q means a narrow peak. 
means an accurate clock, an accurate oscillator. All right, so here is an example. A very accurate oscillator is a tuning fork. Um, they get used, you know, for tuning uh, pianos and so on. So, so you want to have an accurate frequency. And as you probably know, when you hit a tuning fork, it hums for quite a long time. I have a tuning fork. I can actually show you this with. So here's my tuning fork. Uh, this is the microphone. I will get the tuning fork going. And I'm going to bring it up to the microphone. I think you can hear that. And it, this tuning fork will go quite a long time before it stops. So this is a tuning fork with a high Q, a long decay time. All right, so uh, here's an example question. Uh, I've got my tuning fork. And in this example, it starts out with an amplitude of one millimeter. That's probably uh, unrealistically big, but anyway. And after time, five seconds, uh, its amplitude has decayed. It's now a tenth of a milli uh, millimeter of, of motion. So what is the decay time uh, tau? So... Um, in this problem, uh, we know the initial amplitude, which was one millimeter. We know that uh, after uh, five seconds, it's 0.1 millimeters. Uh, the T is the five seconds, so we know that. And the tau is what you don't know. So we need to solve for tau. The algebra gets a little messy here. It involves uh, the natural log, which is the inverse of uh, the uh, exponential. Um, uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, the reverse of 10 to the x is the common log of x, just like the reverse of e to the x is the natural ln uh, log of x. Um, so anyway, um, I use the fact that the natural log is the reverse of the exponential, and eventually I come up with this formula. Tau is the time, which was 5 seconds, over the natural log of the beginning amplitude and end over the ending amplitude, and I get the answer, 2.17 seconds. Okay, now I would like to find out what is the Q factor for this oscillator, for the tuning fork. And uh, so I'm going to use Professor Burnett's uh, uh, information sheet uh, to guide me here. Um, we figured out what tau is. It was uh, 2.17 seconds. Uh, we need to know the natural frequency which in my example was 400 hertz, um, and multiply by pi, and you get your answer. So for good oscillators, the Q factor can be a very big number, uh, 100,000 um, for a really good one. Um, and uh, you know, if you have something that just sort of goes blah, 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 you know, and then stops, it might be 10 or so. Now, I said earlier that in, uh, in your watch or in your cell phone or in a computer, there were uh, mechanical oscillators. And um, this is a picture of a quartz crystal, which is used in a quartz crystal oscillator. So your smartphone probably has uh, a half dozen of these oscillators in it. Um, when you talk about the clock in a computer, right, the computer clock, 100 megahertz or gigahertz computer clock, that's based on this right here. So um, the quartz is a very, um, it, it, it is compressible. It, it acts like a spring, but an extremely stiff spring. 
And these uh, crystals are usually just uh, maybe a millimeter wide and a couple millimeters long. So they have a natural frequency that's extremely high, uh, uh, well over 100 kilohertz, uh, maybe in the megahertz or 10 megahertz range. Now, uh, being a crystal, um, and, and also thanks to the fact that the size of the motion is really tiny, there's very little friction happening as these things oscillate. And so the Q factor can get very high, maybe 100,000 uh, for this type of oscillator. Now, for a pendulum clock, to keep the clock going, there are these two uh, mechanically driven, spring-driven uh, fingers that push the pendulum back and forth. So when the pendulum's over here, it gives a little push and so on. Uh, in your smartphone or in a computer, this is the crystal right here. And um, you have a, a power supply. Here's nine volts, right? Maybe a nine volt battery. And this uh, transistor creates an electric push which bends the crystal slightly. And uh, then the crystal uh, 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 you know, uh, rebounds, and when it rebounds, it gives a little bit of electricity to the transistor, and the transistor says, oh, okay, and then it gives another little push. So there's a, a feedback mechanism going on where the transistor gives an electric push to the crystal, and then the crystal on the rebound gives a little electric push to the transistor, which tells it to push again. And, and so... Uh, uh, a, a crystal oscillator circuit. Okay, so to uh, finish up, um, I already said that um, if you want to use a, uh, a pendulum or, or a mechanical oscillator, the accuracy of that oscillator is, is determined by the width, the resonance width here, this delta F. And uh, going back to the information sheet, we have that the width is equal to the natural frequency divided by the quality factor. So in the case of the tuning fork, what if we decided to uh, use the tuning fork uh, as a kind of the basis of a clock? If we were driving it continuously, what accuracy do you would expect from such a clock. And so uh, we found that in our example, we came up with a quality uh, factor of 2700 um, in, in the previous example. And we were assuming that the, clock, the tuning fork's natural frequency was 400. So 400 divided by 2729 is 0.15 hertz. So as we uh, are driving this, uh, this tuning fork-based uh, clock, the tuning fork, we can expect to be in this frequency range. Um, the left side of the peak is at 399.85 hertz, and the right side of the peak would be at 400.15. So our driven oscillator, our clock, is using this, has as its basis uh, an oscillator that could be uh, in this range. So it's not a perfect oscillator, right? It's not perfectly at 400 hertz. The fact that you are driving it, you're making it go and go and go, uh, means that um, you, you Whatever the you know your driving system will cause it the tuning fork to be a little bit off frequency. It might push it to be a little bit low, or it might push it to be a little bit high, and and this is what you would expect the accuracy of your oscillator to be. Now, in your uh, cell phone, the quartz oscillator has an enormous uh, 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 Q factor maybe a hundred thousand and so um, consequently the peak here is extremely narrow consequently the quartz crystal based clocks are extremely accurate okay 
I hope that you can use this information. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.